Good morning, evening, afternoon, everybody. I uh, just wanted to say, Stephen, that was awesome. I could have I could have listened and, and looked at way more projects. So if you have a larger PowerPoint, you can send that to me and I'll just nerd out on that. That's great. OK, so it is 1243 p.m. Eastern time, 943 Pacific. So I'm in Florida, um, so I'm going to try my best to keep on the West Coast time for you all and not mess that up every time. And let's share. There we go. So this is the AI for Science Bootcamp. Um, yeah, thanks for being here. So a little about myself, I'm a uh, senior data scientist and the, an AI scientist for the NVIDIA AI Tech Center at the University of Florida, also a site lead there. So they have a system not as big as Perlmutter. Uh, it's, it's 140 DGX A100 nodes, which comes out to right around over a thousand A100 GPUs. So I'm in charge of helping UF researchers do AI on that basically. Um, not from the system side, the HPC side, but more on the AI side. So that's my focus. My, my research and dissertation was in generative models, uh, mostly for time series. And then my PhD is in deep learning, machine learning. Um, so yeah, so excited to be here. And this is my fifth boot camp I've taught. Um, so hopefully this goes pretty smooth. So I got about an hour to talk. We're gonna take a break for 15 minutes and then we'll come back and we'll do a lab uh, for, for the remainder of today and then Q&A for 30 minutes. Okay, let me move this little, oh, one second. There we go. All right, so learning goals for today. So we only have a couple hours really over the next two days, right? Um, we can only go so far. So this is a pretty cool picture, right? You can think of it two ways. You think of it as we're going on vacation. Uh, we live up in the mountains and we're finally getting to go to the beach on vacation. So to get there, we'd love to just jump right in, right? Straight shot down the mountain. Um, but unfortunately we can't, right? We got to go around these windy roads to get there. Or you think of the other way. We got a tsunami coming and we got to evacuate ASAP up into higher land. And in that case, it's the same predicament, right? You can't just get there as quick as possible. Unfortunately, sometimes that road and the, the path we got to take is windy and it takes some time. So that's, what's, that's what this trip into learning, some deep learning 101, um, AI, for lack of a better word, that's where we're at right now. And let me see something real quick. Sorry, y'all. There we go. I'm actually going to stop my video because I am lagging on my side. Okay, so the goal of this is, is two main goals. I want you all to be able to be comfortable, and a lot of you might be there already. This is a huge, a huge um, participation we have. So one of the main goals is being able to talk fundamental deep learning, um, enough to read papers, to read tutorials, blogs, and understand what's going on, right? That would be huge for me if you leave here to, today and tomorrow like that. Um, second would be being able to use these notebooks that we're gonna go through and pick your problem set and set it right there where the problem set is in a notebook, your data, All right? Let's say that your data right in that notebook and be able to manipulate what you need to manipulate to get a simple convolutional neural network to run. That'd be huge. Um, those two things alone will get you so far and just setting up that foundational work, right? And this is gonna be high level, especially today. So I'm hoping it, it drives you all to wanna to explore more too and Google some things, look up some other papers or tutorials or anything like that on deep learning to, to you know, span that curiosity to get you to, to dive in deeper. And real quick, like, uh, like I mentioned, I got about an hour to talk and then we're gonna take a 15 minute break. And then we're going to do two labs. They're going to be all in Keras, and we're going to be classifying MNIST, and we're going to be doing a Keras 101 and a CNN lab. So pretty short day, only an hour of me talking, and uh, then you all get to go into it. So I'm going to try to make this as exciting as an hour can be at high level AI. So, so bear with me, um, but I think we're on the right track. So intro to AI, and you can see there in parentheses, I have DL, ML, DS, deep learning, machine learning, data science, AI, all synonymous today in industry for some reason. 
as the buzzword for AI, right? So you can look on LinkedIn, there's probably, you know, 20 million people that are like AI expert, AI scientist, AI researcher, AI practitioner, right? Um, and then you ask them what a neural network is and they don't know because they are maybe data scientists and machine learning engineers, right? But AI is that buzzword. So this is just gonna cover deep learning. Uh, but intro to AI is, you know, we'll talk about that here in a second with a, with a nice little chart. So where we're going to, right, is this whole idea of a new way to code. So we're gonna look at traditional programming back before there was machine learning slash deep learning slash AI, um, not really AI, but, and then what we're at today. So traditional programming, right? You had hardcore coder, hardcore programmer, and they had a task that they needed to accomplish. And they had expert knowledge in that task, or they had to go find somebody with expert knowledge and just kind of understand and write a bunch of pseudocode to the program that they had to write to solve that task, right? And then at the end, they had human readable functions. You know, if, if or statements, um, loops, you know, Boolean things, et cetera. Ton of things that just what we go through, right? You know, I have, I have two kids, three and one, and same thing I'm trying to teach my three-year-old, right? If it feels warm, the stove, it's probably hot, right? She just doesn't look at the stove and knows it's hot. She, you know, you gotta try to teach that. So that's, that's an idea of traditional programming. And then we get into today, software 2.0. We got this awesome optimizer. This is a robot called Atom, which is actually one of the most used optimizers we have in deep learning. And we're gonna feed it a ton of examples. And we're gonna have machine learning understand from the examples and the optimizer, right? Um, finding this space in this manifold world that we, our data lives in. It's gonna find a machine learning function that explains everything we want. So you can see, right? So Task and expert knowledge, not later. Task and expert knowledge is now replaced with just a ton of data, a ton of examples. And hopefully they're labeled, right? For our sake right now, let's just say they're labeled. Make this a little more simple of an analogy to pick up. And instead of a human readable function, machine learning is gonna actually learn our function for us. Now let's look what this kind of looks like, right? So if we have this task, right? We want the probability of it raining. That's our task. And we know we can input temperature, pressure, and moisture levels from some sensor we collect. You know, somebody could go in, they could code function one that says, if temperature is, I don't know, let's say we're in Florida where it's hundred degrees all the time, it can still rain. Um, that's kind of a minute point, right? Where you get the idea, temperature is hundred, then pressure is whatever and moisture is high, then you go to the next function, right? And again, and again, and again. And what that could look like, right, is, is something like this, some handwritten function. Now this, you know, is a little more difficult, right? This is, this is a lot more than just function one, two, and what I made at such a high level. So we have to put temperature, pressure, and moisture, and then you can update the mass, update the momentum, update the energy do macrophysics, do microphysics, and then you finally get some prediction on participation, precipitation. Um, and that's converting expert knowledge into these functions, right? And each one of these would be its own function that's very intense and very labor intensive to write. And now we get into this learn function idea, this machine learning function, where we let our machine learning algorithm get a ton of data, right? And they're gonna learn this as they go. And we'll talk a little bit more what ReLU is. That's an activation function though. And Stigmoid, also an activation function where basically you feed in data and you can see our data is TPQ. It's gonna be multiplied some weight at that first level and a bias will be added in. Very similar to something like uh, MX plus B, right? And from that, it's gonna have some output which we're gonna call A, and it just goes to the next layer, the next you know, function in this equation, in this whole program, and so forth and so forth. And then we get a prediction, right? So you can see how these two things, one very labor intensive, very complex, 
and the other a learned function just based on data that we have that's labeled. It's amazing. Really shifted everything we did uh, and everything we do now in this whole domain. So today, right, learn to use this new approach and <laughs> revolutionize science. I do not know why that's in there, um, but uh, we're gonna we're not gonna actually touch any real world science today. That's gonna be tomorrow. Today we're just gonna do the two easy primer Jupyter notebooks on the Curiosity cluster. That's gonna go over a fully connected neural network, which we'll talk about, and a convolutional neural network. All right, and I mentioned before when I did this slide, AI, DL, ML, DS, right? So this is kind of where that was coming from. At first we had artificial intelligence, right? This was this concept of expert systems executing handwritten algorithms at high speed. You can think of the chess uh, machine, Deep Blue maybe, I think it was called, that executed and beat tons of people in chess. And then in the 80s, early 2000s, well, I guess up to 2010, machine learning was taken over, right? It's a subset of AI, obviously. But instead of having expert systems, we had machine learning algorithms that learned from data, but the data had to be transformed into some handcrafted features, right? Handcrafted features. So feature engineering was a huge component in these two, not decades, what do you call those? Well, in this 20, 30 year span. That's a decade, right? Anyways, um, yeah, from the 80s to 2010, right? Feature engineering, there are probably tons of people with PhDs right now. Well, there's not tons of people with PhDs, but out of the ones with PhDs, a large number uh, that did machine learning, feature engineering could have been a dissertation, right? A whole PhD in doing feature engineering on time series data, on this specific time series data set that's collected from a sensor to do this X, Y, Z thing, right? Um, but now we have deep learning, right? Thanks to good old, Alex and Yinton from Canada, right? For AlexNet 2012, they were like, well, you know, why don't we just use GPUs to accelerate something Jan LeCun did back in the 80s, make it super fast. Well, super fast, faster. And uh, we'll just learn everything from just data, right? We can learn our output and features from data. And that's where we are. So that's why when I use the, that, that quote, AI, ML, DL, data science kind of can encapsulate all of this, right? Because you're doing science on data, data analysis. It really is amazing how far we've gone with deep learning today. And deep learning now is synonymous with AI more than anything, right? All most, a ton of applications out there right now that say AI is just some kind of CNN running on some data, right? And I'll say that with a grain of salt, but just keep that in mind. All right, so deep learning versus machine learning. When should we use deep learning, right? When should we use traditional? So before we get into that, right, let's, let's look at this difference again. And again, I, I hope I hit on it a little bit. Um, this feature extraction, that's the main difference. You have input data, you have a classifier, but feature extraction, you know, it used to be a human in the loop or some feature extraction technique that a human made special for that uh, task, right? So in the case of image classification, I think one that took the world by storm was something called SIFT features. They would pinpoint locations on an image, you had something like, I don't know, 72 SIFT feature locations. And if you showed the image at a different angle, it could still pick up those SIFT locations and get those features, right? So that whole idea of uh, translation and variance was there. And then those features, you know, went through a bunch of things to get the features. They would be put through a classifier. One of the best ones at the time was an SVM, right? SVMs were running lead on all benchmark image classification data sets and a lot of other benchmark classification data sets too. And that stands for support vector machine. You know, random forest is hugely used still. I know that's used in the industry a lot, especially with rapids. Um, XGBoost with rapids is, is it's like in every Kaggle competition you can think of. And Kaggle is an open data science competition um, website that, you know, we have our own team, the Kaggle Grandmasters and NVIDIA, and they all use XGBoost almost every time, it seems. But anyways, traditional machine learning, right? They have that feature extraction. 
deep learning, you learn the features from the input data and do the classification all in one network. Machine learning, feature extraction, implemented on the data, fed into a classifier, okay? So if we have a small set of features, maybe only 10 or 100 pieces of data too, might wanna look at traditional machine learning, right? It's, it's notorious deep learning does need a lot of data. And that's, that's a huge research area, you know, that I'm very passionate about. So my dissertation was trying to do few shot generation using deep learning on time series data, because there's a lot of instances, you know, if we wanna push AI, deep learning applications to make the world better, right? A lot of instances don't have a lot of data collected. So if we only have a few because it's expensive, maybe that occurrence doesn't happen more than once every, every 10 years, right? Things like that, there needs to be a way to be able to generate more data so we can use these tried and true deep learning algorithms or come up with better few shot, zero shot classifiers, uh, you know, detectors, et cetera. Anyways, side note. And then supervised deep learning. So supervised meaning we actually have some kind of label for our data. You know, there's tons of, tons of different examples. There's convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, a LSTM, which is a type of recurrent neural network, long short-term memory. GANs, that's one of my favorite things ever, though the fusion models are taking over in the generation um, domain, the generative domain. So generative adversarial network. And then variational autoencoder is also very popular. And these, finds the, these find features automatically from the data. And you usually have high dimensional data. So images, sound, speech, um, time series, that is, you know, financial data, et cetera, whatever you wanna look at. And there's usually large labeled data sets. And then you can use deep learning. You should use deep learning. And again, in green here, NVIDIA Rapids, I'm just gonna talk on that just cause there's nothing like evangelizing NVIDIA stuff because it actually makes your life a lot easier. So NVIDIA Rapids is just our data science platform on GPUs. So things like NumPy, right? Everyone uses NumPy. Um, we have something called KuPy that you can run on a GPU, get 10, 100x speed up. No joke, <laughs> right? No joke. Um, Pandas, another popular one. We have something called QDF in Rapids. QDF and Pandas are so close one-to-one -one to get a 10x, 100x speed up. You can literally get your environment with NVIDIA Rapids in it that you're running your code on. And instead of importing Pandas as PD, just import QDF as PD and everything should be one-to-one, -one, right? There might be one or two functions that's not right now, um, very rare. But then all your, all your uh, data frame will be on the GPU and every little thing you do will get 10X to 100X speed up. It's amazing. As a side note though, we're not really focused on that today, but Rapids is something I'm very interested in too. So I teach a course on Rapids, use Rapids a lot with my uh, researchers at UF and other researchers. It's just really strong, right? Cuts down the amount of time you're waiting to load in a data set, which, uh, you know, so I will tell this story. Back in my lab, we had a gigantic data set of infrasonic data, time series data from infrasound. And it was typical, you would leave the lab, you would load in the data, come back the next day and your data would be loaded and you could start working, right? That's how long it took to load this humongous data set. And I started NVIDIA. I told my advisor about Rapids. I said, hey, just try this out. You know, you got nothing to lose. And the PhD student who was in the lab at the time did the same method we always do, load in the data, get ready to go home for the evening. Before he got to his vehicle, that data set was loaded in, right? So that is hours now you've added to actually doing research and not just waiting for data to load. And then down here at the bottom for deep learning, we have NVIDIA QDNN, um, which is basically accelerates every framework for deep learning. So this is actually a pretty cool example of complexity when you look at images, right? And this is really close to what we saw from Stephen ForecastNet. They actually, in that paper, talk about atmospheric rivers. But as humans, right, this here, I think, I'm not an expert, is an atmospheric river, right? And think about how you would handcraft an algorithm, not features, but a expert system 
to look for this in an image with a bunch of if, if not, <laughs> uh, whatever you want to think, booleans, anything, to figure out how to tell the computer to look for this exactly and segment this as a atmospheric river, right? It's almost impossible. But with deep learning, you can feed these images in that somebody who actually knows what it looks like, these atmospheric rivers, they can go ahead and highlight a bunch of data, right? They can say, oh yeah, that's one. Feed that into a deep learning algorithm and it can classify it, no problem. Segment it, no problem. That's remarkable, right? That kind of leap and bound to something towards AI is, is just phenomenal. And of course, it's not a fundamental one-on-one -on -one AI course without showing you an artificial neuron and this biological neuron. <laughs> so um, the whole idea, right, is that we can take the way the human brain takes, a, uh, takes information and decodes it and, and gets some kind of prediction out of it into an artificial neuron. So simple equations with adjustable parameters is how this is written. And we can, we can look at this a little more, right? So, you know, you have a bunch of inputs and I, I'm not even gonna try to say all these in the biological. I, I should know them by now as many times as I've taught. But there's the cell body, dendrites, axons, neural impulses, the myelin shelf, sheath, and terminal branches of the ax axon. <laughs> um, Anyways, you can kind of get an idea how this formulates together, right? But back at the beginning when I showed, you know, WX plus B, you can think of, of that more so, right? Um, <clears throat> we have three inputs here, X1, X2, X3. We got weights for each one of those that connect to an output Y. And that's what we're trying to find. And we let the data in this, some activation functions inside each neuron, right? Figure out what this function is to get the best Y. And you can think of it as a generalization of curve fitting too, right? So you can see up here, now granted, it's a little different because it's a polynomial, um, but it's a generalization, right? You're just trying to find some function that gives you the best one. The big difference between these two is this, we just have, you know, in this case, it's 2D, right? We have some floating point numbers. We're trying to find the line of best fit. You can think of this back in the day when you did your chem labs and you're in Excel and uh, you had to do that for the first chemistry lab, right? Find the line of best fit. And you run that little Excel uh, regression line and plot it on your plot. But now what if our data is highly dimensional, right? Highly complex. It's really hard to do a polynomial on something that has you know, a megapixels, one million dimensions of features, right? Even a 786, which is a 28 by 28. That's wrong, 784 dimensions, 28 by 28. So find F given X and Y, right? That's the whole idea. That's all we're doing, find a function. And here we just feed in data. We know what our outputs are gonna be. And we just kind of do this optimization throughout this whole thing, right? So that, that's a very generalization of what deep learning is trying to fit it to an analogy of curve fitting. But let's, let's have a little fun and look at some examples of, you know, images, real world data. And here's one called lunar crater identification via deep learning. So you can see you have some digital elevation map, call it a map, let's just call it an image. I don't wanna upset anyone that actually knows what this is. And uh, you have your ground truth, right? And then you have your predictions and you can see this is actually pretty straightforward and pretty, pretty good results. Um, you know, this is from, from a team, I think from the University of Toronto and it's to automatically detect craters on the moon. That's the whole, the whole point. And their model was able to recover 92% of the craters in their test set. And, and that's amazing. So the blue circles are the ones that got right. And the purple circles are the ones that got wrong in this middle image. And that's, that's remarkable considering there's a lot more blue than there is purple. 
Now on this, this one to the right, I'm not sure the predictions, there must be a way they're scaling out the predictions to make sure. So if they're too small, maybe they're just off-putting them. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, I'd have to look more into that paper. Um, but they were able to identify, oh, that's what it is, that makes more sense. So this is all human labeled, right? The ground truth. And the algorithm was actually able to identify tens of thousands more, thousands more, craters that the humans didn't even pick up on, um, smaller craters that had never been labeled. So the ones on the right are craters that humans missed, right? And you can kind of see things, I guess like that might be a crater right here. Oh, right here. Um, and it kind of picked that up. So that's kind of neat. That's amazing. That example just shows the power of deep learning. Here's a cool one, coronial holes. I believe that is holes coronial, might be sun, um, but they use a UNET, right? So UNET's very popular, especially in medical segmentation. Um, anything really segmentation is pretty neat. We're not gonna touch on UNET in today at all. I think there is a, a way to use it tomorrow in one of the CFD labs. But this is from NASA Goddard and their heliophysics team. The ground truth is indicated by the blue there. I think you can see, well, that teal. And that's provided by a very slow handcrafted algorithm. Um, so someone went through an expert system and tried to label these, right? And that's what they use as their, their ground truth. And the yellow indicates the pixel probabilities that is actually a coronial hole, the probability of that detection. It's pretty remarkable. Sunspot prediction, not on people, but on, uh, on the sun, right? Predicts all zeros unless special care is taken, right? So it's a highly imbalanced data set. And I'm actually working on something like this now with some researchers from the University of Florida where we have epilepsy onset zones in the brain and our data set's like 95% class zero, not an onset zone. And the rest of it, the little 5% of it is onset zone. And it's amazing how much pre-processing and data engineering goes in before we can even get something valuable on the outside. So they undersample the majority class, they super sample the minority class to try to even things out, use a focal loss, which is a new type of loss. It's not just like a uh, mean square error or anything like that. And they select small crops from high res imagery. So the crops with large fractions of sunspot pixels will be the positives and the negatives will be ran a selected crops, right? So they're really trying to bring this data set down to something that they can use on a, on a deep learning algorithm. And they train the convolutional network on small crops only and predict on full resolution images. And the results are pretty good, again, right? Um, it, it enabled them to label 1.5 million images where they would have taken probably 1.5 million days to do it with their slow handcrafted algorithm. So just remarkable. All right, so deep breath, everyone. We have, uh, we have about 34 minutes left. And I have a chunk of slides to go through. So now we'll get into a little bit of training. What's it like to train these algorithms? Um, what are we doing when we train them? And then we'll get into implementation basics. What do you need to do deep learning? Basically, uh, spoiler, there's GPUs involved, right, in this one. And we'll look at deep learning in our GPUs. And then I'll get in a little bit on the intro to deep learning. So fully connected networks and CNNs. So in this training versus inference phase, we can think of training as this awesome Lego, looks like a transformer, no pun intended. Um, and you're going to try to build this transformer out, right? So this is training. So you think of it in your deep learning algorithm, your machine learning algorithm. You got all your data, and you're trying to piece together this this training with all this data and this algorithm to get the optimization, right? The best optimal use case of your of your model. And then we have our inference phase. We uh, this is not a transformer. I think that's, I don't even know what this is. This is like an old cartoon model, I think. Nonetheless, um, 
we got this transformer, let's say, this, this bot, and now it can go do things. Um, so you could apply the completed model, right? So that's the difference. We train, and then we use that model that's been trained, it's converged, hopefully, and we can deploy it in inference mode or test mode or in the wild, right? Anything like that, where it's actually looking at real world use cases, um, data it's never seen, and it's applying everything it learned from training to that data. And then you can continuously do this with online learning, right? Um, some adaptive approach where you're constantly retraining your algorithm from checkpoints and making the algorithm better, right? That's a model deployment and keeping things up. It's huge in industry right now. So training the players, right? We need data, we need a model, we need a loss function, we need an optimizer. And you might be thinking, these are some pretty cool pictures. Well, they definitely are. Um, but we need, we need data, right? So training data describes the behavior we wish to learn. So our data hopefully is labeled in this case. Like I said, we're, we're just thinking about supervised learning right now. The model is that function, the equation we're trying to fit to take that loss function and minimize it optimally, right? To get it as well, let's find the optimum, it might be a maximum we're trying to do. But for this case, let's just say we're trying to find the minimum loss. So if this is error, reconstruction error, let's say, there it is, reconstruction error, we want that to be as small as possible, right? Because we want our reconstruction to look just like the input. And then we have an optimizer that is basically the strategy to search this manifold space, this um, optimization space to find these optimal parameters to get our model to have the best weights to have the minimum loss, right? So it all kind of works together. Many choices to be made though. So here is one of those techniques that we use. It is the technique we use, not one of, to find a solution for this large manifold space that our data lives in, our optimization space. And it is called gradient descent, right? So here in this 3D space, we start at some random point with random weights. That could be our first pass through the data, right? We compute the gradient of that loss function and we send it back, right? And we'll talk a little more about this. And then we take a step in the descending gradient descent and we move a little bit and we try to get to some optimal, right? Some minimum in this case. So we stop when the error is small. Now, in this case, it looks like there's two saddle points that could be similar errors, right? Well, that's something hopefully our manifold space, our optimization space is well behaved and doesn't have a ton of saddle points. There's nothing you can be too sure about, right? So a lot of these optimizers help with that. Um, and here is one, two, three, six different optimizers. I wish this would play on, on loop, it does, great. So you can see SGD, that's called subgradient descent. Momentum is subgradient descent with momentum. Nesterov, Adagrad, RMS Prof, and Adam. They're all different optimizers, right? So Adam's the one we use the most. And it's it's slower, that is true, but it doesn't get stuck in, in any kind of saddle points or anything like that. Now, in this use case that we're looking at right now, you can see they all get to this local minima, this minima we're trying to get to. Um, Adam just takes a sweet time to get in there. <laughs> but uh, Adam stands for adaptive momentum. And it works well for many image problems, for sure. And basically, it's a way to jump over local minimum to get to a global minimum. And I mentioned back propagation, right? Compute the gradient, efficiently assigning weights. So we do a forward pass of all our data through a network. So all our data gets pushed through a network. All these weights remain constant, right? Remember the weights up. So think of these as all X1, X2, X3, X4, and so forth. They go forward to the next layer. We have weights assigned to each one of these. Everything's fully connected. So there's a ton of weights, as you can see with all these lines. And we get to some output prediction and we have a loss function, right? So we compute the gradient of that loss function and propagate it backwards to update those weights, right? All those weights. And you can see that with the 
the, the blue line um, and the red line too. But that's, that's the goal, right? We're trying to update weights, these parameters, with the gradient from the, from the post-seeding layer, right? So the layer um, further back. So back propagates all the way through. And then, you know, each weight can be nudged, you know, a little bit in some small amount of direction to obtain this, this great function that gives us that optimal. But that's why we train on a lot of data to make sure that backpropagation is a little more sophisticated. And we train a many epics, right? Many epics, mm -hmm. epics being one pass through the entire data set. And those epics give us a better understanding of what's going on in the data to update this function. All right, and then, you know, this is, this is a, a pet peeve of mine. So here's a soapbox. I don't know why we talk about PyTorch autograd when this whole thing is in TensorFlow and Keras, but they do the same thing. So TensorFlow and Keras has an autograd. So basically we don't have to compute the gradient. We let the framework compute it for us and take care of the back propagation for us, right? So this entire slide, all you gotta get out of this is these deep learning frameworks make this effortless for us right now. And if you have a loss function that's custom and it's differentiable, you can use PyTorch Autograd, TensorFlow's Autograd, um, Keras, which is part of TensorFlow, and it will go ahead and compute the gradient for you and do all that, right? You just have to input the function into you know, computer code, right? It's, it's pretty remarkable. But Again, they just make it simple for us, which is great. We like simple. Now, this idea of curve fitting with a single layer, it's just, we're looking at this, and this is a bunch of code. So if you haven't seen TensorFlow before, this is what it looks like, um, TensorFlow Keras. We have our data, we just make some random data, and we assigned some validation data and training data, right? So you're like, what is that? What's the difference, right? We have predictions too, that's our black line. So we actually do a great job fitting this line, right? But are we overfitting? That's a word we use a lot, right? Overfitting. And you're like, what does that even mean? Well, overfitting is when we fit our model too well to the training data, and then it doesn't rationalize well, right? So let's, let's talk a little more about our data and sense. And we have a whole pile of data. And what we're gonna do with that data is break it up in training data for the training of the model. Here's this validation word, validation data for hyperparameter tuning and test data for final eval. So in a training loop, you're gonna train the model and each epoch, it's gonna see some data it's never seen before, oh, sorry. See some data it's never seen before. And it's gonna validate on that, right? So basically, it's gonna look at this data as if it's test data in that epic. And then you get some kind of score, right? If you're doing accuracy, you'll get accuracy on validation data. And then after your model has gone through X amount of epics for training and it's converged, you're gonna use that model on the test data that it's never seen. And that's what you would publish on in like a benchmark situation or you know a new paper or anything like that. Or you can think of this test data as data in the wild. So you're gonna deploy your model out in the wild, say it's a camera trap for detecting animals. And hopefully it does a great job classifying every animal it sees in the woods. And a way to you know, go back to this overfitting idea is we need to monitor this validation loss, right? So you can determine if your model is learning by tracking the training error or training loss and the validation training loss, right? And you can do this with something called TensorBoard. PyTorch has TensorBoard as well. Or you can actually do what this is doing and, you know, <laughs> keep them all and plot them out afterwards. The drop in the blue training curve means the function is learning, right? So our training function is learning on training data. That's good because our training curve, the blue line is dropping. Come on, computer. Oh, I'm hitting Windows key. Uh, it's, it's, it's going down, right? And you can notice the scale is logarithmic, so it's going down pretty significantly. Um, and the drop in the orange, the validation data, shows our model is getting better at predicting points. It's not being trained on, right? So in other words, the model is generalizing well. 
which we want. If that validation loss was coming down and plateaued way above the training loss, we could think our model is probably overfitting to the training data. Then you got to go through a bunch of techniques to try to overcompensate overfitting. So implementation basics, you know, you need data to do deep learning. You need a machine learning framework. This should be deep learning framework. Um, in this case, we're using TensorFlow and Keras. And you need a GPU. Do you really need a GPU? Yes. Nah, I work for NVIDIA, I have to say that. Um, you can do CPU, but it just takes forever. So GPUs really make life simpler for us. Then there's different deep learning frameworks. Python base, we have PyTorch and Keras TensorFlow. And before, when I would talk about this, I told everyone, I knew no one that used MXNet or Julia. And Stephen and his awesome plots showed that he has five people using these combined. So there are people out there, but I know nothing about MXNet, Gluon, or Flux. So I'm just a PyTorch guy. Um, I used TensorFlow when it first came out when we had to use a Bazel compiler to get it into C, C++, and that was miserable. So now it's all in PyTorch, it's really great. And then for our case, we use Jupyter Notebooks. I'm a big IDE guy, because I like debugging and some variables and everything on the fly. Um, but Jupyter Notebooks are really popular because you, you have something you can present. You know, if you're gonna make this open source, everyone loves reading blogs, especially blogs with code. Why not have a blog with code that you can execute like a Jupyter Notebook or a Google Collab? And then, you know, NVIDIA GPU Cloud Registry. We have a ton of stuff on the NVIDIA GPU cloud. Um, we have containers that are optimized for NVIDIA GPUs. We have a ton of SDKs like Clara, well, Mon Monai. Monai is our medical imaging SDK. Hui Wins our TA here today. She's a Monai expert, so I'm just giving her a shout out. Um, she saves my life a lot at UF. <laughs> we have tons of uh, SDKs. We got Nemo, Nemo Megatron, Megatron. They're all doing large language models or NLP or even you know, speech recognition, things like that. Uh, it goes on and on. We have so many SDKs. But at the NVIDIA GPU Cloud Registry, NGC, you can get a container and get a bunch of models that are pre-trained, and then you can go ahead and play with them all right there, <laughs> as is on your system. It's, it's quite remarkable. And I thought I took these slides out. I'm very sorry. The point of this slide, um, we can do regression with something simple like SKLearn, right? Or we can do regression with something like TensorFlow. So it's pretty universal, right? It's not just deep learning. You can do things like regression. Um, I actually don't know why this slide's in there. But anyways, we'll move on. Deep learning and GPUs. Everyone's doing great. We got 20 minutes left. All right, so this is actually pretty cool code. I love verifying my GPUs. Um, it's very important when I'm doing multi-GPU things, which we don't touch on here, so I do apologize for that. But we do do a ton of single GPU. And it's good to know if you even have a GPU that you can access. Um, funny story I had, just started my job prior to NVIDIA where I ran an AI prototype lab for the DOD. They got me this sweet workstation with two GPUs. I was like, yeah, this is great thought I was using because they were NV linked and everything these two GB 100s which it shows right here um, thought I was using multi GPU work and kept getting OOM errors out of memory I was like what is going on in here one of the GPUs wasn't even uh, PCI'd right into the board so um, if I would have just ran one piece of code to see what devices I had available it probably would have stopped Probably like four weeks of misery at that job. Nonetheless, this is uh, important stuff. So one line for TensorFlow, one line for CARES, you know, just to find out if you have GPUs and what GPUs you have. PyTorch is a couple lines, you know, just to get more printouts on it, but doing this is very important. And they do that in the lab, so you don't have to worry about copying this down. And then, you know, I mentioned this before, like GPU usage in deep learning frameworks is simple. It just, they let us do it, right? It's, it makes life easy, these deep learning frameworks. We'll not talk about Julia, but that looks like, looks like hocus pocus. But Keras automatically is a GPU, TensorFlow too. PyTorch is actually a, a little more robust, right? Cause you can do a bunch of things on the CPU too. You don't have to do everything on the GPU. 
um, for other things, not just deep learning, right? So you actually have to do this two device thing in PyTorch to be able to utilize the GPU. But PyTorch is really good documentation, really good uh, debugging and will let you know if you have a tensor that's on the CPU and you forgot to put it on the GPU, right? And then the coolest thing NVIDIA ever did for a terminal is NVIDIA SMI, System Management Interface. Let's you look at your GPUs. You can look at it real time by typing in watch space NVIDIA SMI dash SMI. Uh, and you can see everything there is. You can see your GPU fan usage, right? Um, the temperature they're running at. And when we were running a super large language model on this new super pod at the University of Florida, we actually had our temperatures get up to 80 degrees Celsius. I think higher 80s and it flagged, right? Like we were flagged by that. So we were actually monitoring that and flagged because that means really slow training. Um, something's not cooling correctly and we had to troubleshoot that quick or else, you know, things just don't, don't perform up to par. Um, you can look at your, your wattage, you know, what you're, what you're using power wise, your memory, that's always important. And then GPU utilization. This is one of the best ones. We actually want to have that at 100% and have your wattage up sky high, right? It means you're getting the most out of your GPU. And typically, if that's happening, your memory's pretty capped too. And you can see your process information too. NVIDIA SMI in the terminal. Unbelievable. All right, let's get into some fun stuff. Fully connected networks, MLPs, multi layer perceptrons. In Keras, they're called dense networks. Given a neuron that is connected to every single neuron in the previous layer. So we get tons of weights, right? In this case, we got four, eight inputs, and we have six in the next layer. So I'm not gonna do my math right. I think that's 48 different weights right there alone. Could be way wrong. But anyways, everything's connected. That's the whole point of a fully connected network, right? So every piece of input data has an impact to the next layer and every output of that layer has an impact to the next layer and so forth. So everything impacts the output, that prediction. And each one of these neurons, not in the input obviously, but each one of the neurons in the layers and the output, they have an activation function. So sigmoid and tan H were used first in, in everything. Um, but we had a lot of discrepancy with those because they have errors in training, right? Sometimes things would just blow up, things would vanish, things didn't do well. <laughs> so uh, the tried and true now is ReLU, which is rectified linear unit, which is just a linear function where anything negative, we just chop to zero, right? So that max zero or X, and it gives you some non-linearity to your network and you learn a bunch of really cool stuff. Um, used a lot in CNNs, tons in CNNs, and pretty much anything now, really. I don't see many TAN age or sigma usage. But leaky relu, we use a lot in GANs, generative adversarial networks, because sometimes we need some negative input, um, negative output, sorry, from that activation function. Now you could be thinking, wow, what's that even mean? What's that look like? But do not fear, because I have the share new screen, you share. Screen three, boom. Playground.tensorflow.org. Highly suggest you play with this if you are new to neural networks. This is looking at dense, get out of here. Dense neural networks, multi-layer perceptrons. Um, everything I just said, right? So let's play with it, right? Say we have data, 2D data. You can input either your X1, X2, you can put x1 squared as well, x2 squared, x1 times x2, the sine of x1, sine of x2, okay? And this is just set up to train in TensorJS, I think TensorFlow.js JavaScript on your browser. Um, so it's a lot of fun, right? So if we have our activation function as sigmoid, and we're gonna try to learn this distribution over here, that's the whole point, right? We're gonna try to find decision boundaries um, of these two classes. So if you hit play, actually follow it over here. Where, there it goes. Hopefully everyone can see that. Let's see, maybe if I make it a little bigger. 
And we're going to, it's still learning. Um, you can see the training data is learning. We'll just stop it here at a thousand ish. You can see we didn't do too hot, right? But let's just change it to relu, same exact network, right? Input x1, x2, um, two hidden layers with two neurons each. Each one is relu activation. It looks like the same thing's happening, right? It's just not learning this well. And like, what is going on? It is fun to watch. This isn't even that complex of a distribution, like a decision boundary, you would think. Um, so we're way past that, right? So let's go tan H. And this is this is literally, oh sorry. If you hover over this, it will tell you what each neuron's learning. So apologies there. I've seen that difference. This this isn't anything special. I'm just doing this to like let you play with what's going on in an MLP, because this looks so much better than slides. Um, so we actually have trouble with that too, right? So what if we add a neuron to each hidden layer? Boom, isn't that amazing? Like one extra neuron allowed us to hit that decision boundary effortlessly. Um, so here's a fun one. We run it with tan H. This is tan H, right? And it's, it's just converged. If we want to relu, it looks like it's converged too, right? Did not do a good job. But this is a case where knowing the data a little better, like what if we just ran x1 times x2, right? And we'll just take one away too. That's just effortless, right? <laughs> like that's, I love it. Anyways, so um, playground.tensorflow.org. It's a lot of fun. Uh, this, I think, is the most complicated one to learn. It's the uh, Swiss roll is what that's called. And if you run that, we won't give it X1, but different features you can give it, right? It, it's very hard for it to figure this out. Um, what it does do as good as it can. You can see the training fluctuations, right? This isn't something to be scared about if you see this. You just let it train longer. What you want to see, though, is this training loss and test loss decrease. Let's just go into town. Crazy. Anyways, it's fun, fun little thing to play with. Let's get back to the slides. Cool. I'll move that out of the way so we're not looking. Okay, so this is a deeper neural network, more layers left, more levels of abstraction. This is a super old paper. This is actually a deep belief network. Um, again, don't know why it's in here, but the whole idea is low level features are learned in these layers closest to the input and low level features, meaning edges, textures, you know, blobs, mid-level features as you move closer to the output like objects, right? So here we're learning, oh, I got it right. Here we're learning like uh, lines and edges and things. Mid-level, we're learning objects, um, pieces of objects, right? Not really objects, but like a nose, an eye, here's an ear, things like that. Um, and then the closer you get to the output, the high-level features come out. So we're actually learning objects, which is whole faces. There's a popular paper out, I think it was Google net, uh, no, it might have been Inception, where it learned, one of the neurons learned a, uh, a cat, right? And they're like, oh my gosh, this is the craziest thing ever. Learned a whole cat. So when a cat's fed into the input, that's the only neuron that fires at those lower levels. And boom, you know, it's cat. But the difference being, this is a deep belief network. CNNs and MLPs work similar, right? So if you have a bunch of layers, those layers closest to the input, will have low level features and those layers closest to the output will be higher level features. All right, eight minutes to go. We're doing great, y'all are all stars. I don't see hardly anything in the chat. Awesome, we'll keep going. So CNNs, what are CNNs used for? CNN stands for Convolutional Neural Network. Problems with translational invariance is why they came about. 
but they're used in 1D and uh, audio and time series, right? And variance in time. They're used in 2D, of course, computer vision, 2D spaces. You can think of a, a video, right, as images through time. So that could be like 3D or computational physics, right? And there are multiple different computer vision tasks that we might want to do. Um, there's classification. So we'll look at the top row. I like talking about dogs and cats. The bottom row, though, is more science, <laughs> you know, weather related. So I'll try my best. Um, but here's a picture of a cat. The classification would say, what is this a picture of? Right? This looks like a cyclone, tropical cyclone. What is this a picture of? That's classification. Show it an image. Tell me what it is. What class does that image belong to? Classification and localization is a type of object detection we can think of. But basically, it's what's in this picture and where's it at? Right? So classification. This is a cat, and that cat's right here. Hey, this is a cycl tropical cyclone, and that cyclone is right there in that image. And then you get into object detection. Object detection is what all is in this image, what objects are in this image, and can you tell me what those objects are? So basically, it's classification and localization on multiple objects. So we have two cats, a duck, and this adorable puppy. And this is where they're at. Same down here, right? This looks like it has spotted six cyclones, tropical cyclones. And I'm just going to make a whim that this is an atmospheric river, <laughs> just because it seems like a buzzword right now. Um, and then instant segmentation is exactly object detection, except instead of a bounding box of precisely where it's at in the image, tell me every pixel associated with that object and give me that outline around those pixels, that segmentation. So here's the cat, here's the cat. That's a tightly knit crop around the cat, the duck and the puppy. Same thing with the cyclones. Though this thing here that it thought was a cyclone is now turned green. I don't know what that is. Good old nurse gave us that image, so we need to figure that out. Um, but atmospheric river, right? Here's that. So there's different tasks we can do. Now here's an example of classification, looking at satellite images and seeing what the land use is. So we have a satellite orbiting, going crazy, and we want to figure out, hey, what's, uh, what's this piece of land being used for? And some of them are pretty, pretty simple, right? Like, oh, you see some airplanes, there's a good chance this is like, you know, a runway. Um, baseball diamond, beach, buildings. It's these ones where it's like mobile home park versus medium residential versus dense residential. Like that's a tough one to decipher through, right? So it's pretty powerful what these deep learning algorithms can do on images with the right data labels. Now, why not just use a fully connected network on images, right? Well, I mentioned before, everything's connected, fully connected. Each is connected to the next and so forth and so forth. So if we have a megapixel image, one megapixel is 1 million pixels, our input's already 1 million. So that's 1 million weights we automatically have to learn if our next layer just had one neuron. Now, if I had two, you know, this goes up, three, four, five, you can get the idea, right? They just don't scale well at all. So they created CNNs to kind of help with that, um, that issue. And we'll talk a little more on that too. It's also, Objects in nature, the translation and variance, right? Objects in nature look the same from place to place. I mentioned SIF features before. SIF would try to you know, pinpoint these ears and the eyes and these feet on this cat. Um, and then when you move the cat, hopefully it picked up the same exact features on the cat, right? The same locations. Well, CNNs, they just don't care, right? You put that cat anywhere in this image. You can even turn this cat upside down. Still do a pretty good job of classifying it as a cat. Now there was a paper called CapsuleNet that came out by Hinton it was hidden, where he said, if this cat was Picasso, right, on this image, and he had his head, or she, this little cute cat, whatever it is, um, it had its nose here, eyes on its feet, and ears somewhere else, the CNN would actually still classify that as a cat, because it's picking up on those different objects in the image from that 
you know, mid-layer learning objects. And CapsuleNet was supposed to help that, but CapsuleNet never took off. Um, there's some papers on it and that. The implementation was rough and it really didn't do what it was promised. Theoretically looked great, application-wise was not. So CNNs are still tried and true. So what is a convolution? It's just a small matrix transformation applied at each point on the image, typically through some convolutional kernel. In this case is a three by three edge detector kernel, a feature detector kernel, sorry, not edge detector. And you just put it over the exact location on the image. You update that middle pixel, see, and you just slide it, right? You might be thinking, wow, that is very complex. Well, do not fear, because guess what? I have another cool website. <laughs> um, I know we're getting close to time. That's okay. We might go a little over our break. But this is Polo Club GitHub IO CNN Explainer. Take a look at this. Check it out. I'm going to put it in the chat right now. Oh, thanks whoever put the playground, the TensorFlow playground. Aaron, thank you so much for putting that link in there for people. Um, this is really cool, right? So it talks about what's a convolution, what's going on, what's a neuron, what's a tensor, what's a layer, how you update kernel weights and that. What do each layer of the network do? And then you get down here, it'll actually look at each network, right? So it, you can see that kernel, see that little kernel? Here it is, oh, missed it. That little kernel sliding around this image and updating as it goes, right? Then it updates, right? So this is this is just a little video of it. Um, but they actually have this going around too. So it's it's remarkable stuff. It's a great little 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 tutorial blog. You understand how hyperparameters of each kernel and what it's doing. Um, it's interactive, right? So this is when you have a uh, five by five input, but your kernel is a two by two. So if you have seven by seven, you have a one pad, and you run a three by three, you can see how it's updating the seven by seven with the padding, right? I didn't know it was gonna change that. Anyways, check that out, play with it or some. The notebooks today go over this really well too. And uh, at the end of this is a video tutorial how you can actually go in and play even more, right? And just try to understand what CNNs are doing to a little higher level. All right, so with that, we are at time. I'm gonna take five more minutes everybody's time. Really sorry, um, I just talked too much. So this is a Sobel filter. So, you know, back in the day when people had the feature engineer, uh, we talked about somebody spent forever figuring out, hey, how can I get edges uh, from a convolutional filter? And what would that look like? So Sobel came in and he, it's like, oh, if we have this filter, we'll get horizontal edges. And if we have this filter, we'll get vertical edges. Oh, vice versa. And boom, if you apply those, that's what you get. Pretty neat. Um, but now CNNs actually go in and learn optimal filters, right? So this just goes over some of, this is the last bit of slides I have before a break. So this is good. So ImageNet is the standard benchmark image classification data set. And I think we've, they're trying to change it because there is some scrutiny in ImageNet where actual images aren't labeled correctly. It's a bunch of RGB images, a thousand classes. Then there's a subclass of 10 classes. So like dog is a class or you can have Portuguese water dog, collie, I don't even know, Rottweiler, things like that. So that's the, the classes versus the subclass. Um, and I made this. So this was in there, but in 1998, Lacoon created Lynette. Actually, I thought it was 88. Um, and then AlexNet is what spurred the deep learning revolution, right? So using a GPU, they accelerated the convolutional CNN portion and how it updates and backprops, and everything blew up since then. Um, that went to VGG and Inception in 2014, ResNet in 2015, Exception, ResNet 50, and DenseNet in 2019. And these were all state of the art in ImageNet classification. And then I added this because now we're in this transformer error. The VIT is the vision transformer. It is, you know, Stephen mentioned a little bit, pre-trained on a bunch of data. 
and then fine tune on a specific task. And it's destroying things in every, <laughs> every aspect of every benchmark across domains. Um, 88, I knew it was 88. Lynette uh, first started it looking at you know, MNIST for the USPS. This was super slow because there was no GPUs at the time utilizing uh, acceleration. So SVMs, core vector machines, with some feature engineering actually outperformed this. So it kind of died right after this publication. And then Alex came in with uh, Hinton and one ImageNet with a CNN that took you know, an accelerated pace of training compared to Lynette. And people started paying attention because it didn't just win. It blew past second place in the uh, previous benchmark. Um, VGG is just basically, let's get the biggest network we can get <laughs> with a ton of different uh, layers of different sizes. And VGG is used a ton for feature extraction right now. And you're like, well, I thought we didn't have to do that. It's true. Um, but you can actually use these networks, pull features, and then use those features in different downstream tasks as well, like uh, video tracking, object detection, things like that. Inception, Google Annette. Um, trains different size convolutions in parallel, right? So it's just a more complicated model, but these models get larger as we go on, GPU power gets greater, right? The hardware gets better. ResNet has 23 million parameters and ResNet you know, basically helps with learning the identity function by a skip layer. Um, ResNet 50 means 50 different layers of this. So it's, it's, it's crazy. Here's a plain CNN and you can see the, uh, ResNet is just the plain CNN with some skip layers. DenseNet came in and said, hey, what if we uh, just made everything connected, right? And every CNN layer can know what's going on from previous CNN layers, right? So it has a more universal understanding of everything being learned and trained from the data. And it did great, but it's huge, right? It's pretty dense and it takes a hot minute to train even on GPUs, but it's, it, it works. And then we get to vision transformers. So this is not from the original paper, but I like the mushroom was actually shown pretty high. So it's an idea. Um, so just taken from NLP where you have sentences, you do you know, some type of patching or tokenizing, you flatten it and you get your position embedding and then you use this transformer or encoder, which is this over here to the right. Um, very powerful. And like I said, it's just taking over. So that's it. That's all I had for right now. Um, put my camera back on. Hopefully my internet's better. Here's what happens when your wife comes home, gets on her phone. Um, but yeah, that's all I have. So we, it's, it's 10.50 your time, 1.50 my time. So we'll take a break until for 10 minutes, come back at 11 and we will get on curiosity and we'll start the labs. I'll actually talk a little bit about the lab. Um, we'll look at some challenges here. Yeah, I'm still sharing my screen, so that's good. So just challenges to spur some conversation and then we'll talk about the lab, okay? But right now, go ahead and take your bio break. Thanks so much for listening to me talk for an hour and five minutes. Do apologize for that. And uh, yeah, I'll see you back here in 10 minutes. All right back at it. So while people are funneling in, because we had 100 some, now we're down to 90. Mm, that's okay. I'll uh, talk about some, some challenges that actually Stephen, see what I'm telling you, that presentation you gave was awesome. <laughs> but uh, some of the challenges they have, right? And it's, it's labeling large quantities of data. So ways we can overcome that without manual labeling. And before I get into that, Automatic labeling is like a billion some dollar industry, it seems right now. There's startups left and right that are doing labeling and synthetic data and labeling and things like that. But data fusion is pretty cool. So that's kind of what, very similar to what Stephen was talking about, using one data source to label for another. So if you have a bunch of like LIDAR point clouds, let's say, you have no label for it, but you have some 2D images, and then you do some nifty nerf to it, then you nerf, um, get a 3D, <laughs> 3D model. You can label that point cloud from that 3D model, right? Self-supervised learning, that's huge. 
that's a uh, transformer 101 all over it. Reinforcement learning, I actually haven't seen too much of that, but reinforcement learning is absolutely amazing. That's something I wish, if I could go back and do my PhD all over again, I would do reinforcement learning. But my wife said, I'm not allowed to do that. So. And then human in the loop, right? So that's a big thing in like text summarization and NLP is having someone sit there and see what's happening, to correct it, and then the model will self-correct itself. Um, transfer learning, that's gigantic, especially for like image classification where you take one of those huge pre-trained networks I showed you on ImageNet and just use that for whatever downstream task you have. Or you can, you can, uh, yeah, we do that a lot in our NVIDIA DLI for fundamentals of deep learning. But this is neat. They're transferring everything they learned in an omniverse environment, the simulated environment of this robot arm. And then they just take it and fine tune it on the real data set in real life. And then pins, forcing physical constraints. That's just, that's just awesome, right? Um, ForecastNet has a lot to do with that. The, the Fourier neural operator and things like that, keeping physical constraints, um, abiding by the laws of physics, and uh, just it's amazing where we're going at now in deep learning. And interpretability. So this is something I, I think is very cool. I know when I was working for the government, the DoD, this is something they always wanted, right? So they want a network that gives you classification results, but they want to know how confident the network was in itself. So, you know, typical, hey, this is a volcano. That's all you want to hear, right? And look at that, that volcano is pretty high. But what they want is this is, I'm 95% certain this is a volcano and I'm 100% confident in my classification result. And that's the type of deep Bayesian network, not Bayesian belief, but a Bayesian neural network. Um, that's, that's what I've seen. This is a layer wise relevance propagation that they're shown here, super cool stuff. All right, so let's get into the labs. Um, the standard hello world for deep learning is MNIST. Um, digit classification, handwritten digit classification. And you know, this has been tried and true, thousands of papers on it. I think the benchmark now is like 99.97% accuracy. So it's almost perfect. Um, it's not that difficult, right? And this is a 2D CNN that you could use to train and test and get a huge, huge accuracy on this, right? So here's your data. You're going to load it. You're going to reshape it. You're going to, you know, take the, the labels to categorical, which uh, they'll talk about in the lab a little bit. You build your model. You train it. It's gone. You train it here, one line, and then you evaluate it, right, on the test data. So pretty cool stuff. This is actually written incorrectly. So this test, this validation data should not be X test and Y test. So this is cheating because you don't want to ever see that when you test the data, right? So in essence, they should have another category called XVAL and YVAL, where it's part of the training data that you use for the validation. But what we're gonna look at is slightly more interesting. It's called Fashion MNIST. It's 10 different classes of little thumbnails of different types of clothing um, and, and bags. So t-shirt, trousers, pullovers, dress, and so forth. And this is something that they tried to preach a lot in these boot camps. And someone came up the other time I taught this and they had discrepancy in it, but we'll go with this six step approach. You have data and with that data, you know, you have some task, right? And the discrepancy was shouldn't a task come before data? And you know, you could think of that as just some kind of replaceable loop. You have a task that you want to solve and you have data, you know, you need for that task that can solve it or vice versa. Hey, I have this data. I wonder what it could solve, right? So that's the two different ways of looking at it. You have a model, you have that loss, you're going to train it which is learning, and then you're gonna evaluate. That six step approach is what we'll take with this. So let's, so I'll actually walk through this. Hopefully everybody got on curiosity. Share screen. There we go, let me get these things, these zoom things out of the way. All right, so here we are. Hopefully everyone got to hear. So today only we're gonna do intro to DL. So you'll click on that directory. I hope everyone can see that. Let me go back. So when you when you launch the lab, you see intro to DL, tropical cyclone intensity, and start here. So you could start with start here. 
check your GPUs, right? Um, always fun to do that. And then it will tell you what you're gonna do. CNN primer and Keras 101. And then the next one would be tropical cyclone. We'll do tropical cyclone intensity estimation tomorrow. And you can see I do have a GPU. Now, if you go to this plus, you can actually run that uh, NVIDIA SMI that I was talking about in Jupyter by putting exclamation NVIDIA dash SMI. And you can see we are indeed on A100s that are 80 gig A100s. Um, so they're powerful, the most powerful GPU you can have right now that's in production. So you're gonna have a lot of fun, very powerful machine at your hands. So what you're gonna do is go into intro to deep learning directory. Now, this is the most confusing part in the world. You do not start at CNNs, you start at part two. I don't know why it's called that, but that's where we start. <laughs> um, so CNN and Primer, please take your time, read this. This is so well put together, it's unbelievable. They'll go through that six step approach that I kind of glossed over. Um, and then each step of the way, right, they talk about the data. They talk about pre-processing the data, why you're doing this, why you're doing that, right? You, you understand it from the code, and then they have stuff written about it on why you're doing it. Like, here's a great one. The image pixel values on a grayscale image range from 0 to 255. So now they want to normalize it between 0 and 1 for your train and test data. And then every lab, it seems I get this question, why are we doing this? And it says it right here, the normalization of the pixels help us by optimizing the process with the gradients are computed. All right, so take your time, right? Really gather what you want out of this lab. Now you could, in theory, hit run all and get it done, um, but you don't really learn anything from that, right? And we're here to learn. And some of you here might already know everything in this primer course. And for that, I'm sorry, you can run through, maybe do a quick update uh, in your brain, kind of hang out with us for another hour. And uh, yeah, so you'll do part two first, right? So this is a, uh, this is an MLP. You'll go through data pre-processing, defining your model, and you're just gonna make a, a dense network, uh, an MLP. And then after you're done that, you'll go to CNNs, okay? And please read through that. This is really good too. They go through the convolution and, and things of that sort. So it's, it's extremely well written. You'll learn a ton from the notebook. So take your time, ask questions in your group, ask questions to the TA in the group, um, anything like that. So there is one thing I want to note at the end of each notebook, have something highlighted, right? Shut down the kernel. So in the cloud, when we're doing this, um, on A100s with TensorFlow, when the notebook is up, it automatically allocates that GPU. So when we get into tomorrow's stuff, you know, our labs, we'll get a lot of, hey, I got OOM errors, I got OOM errors. It's typically because no one went down and shut the, the kernels. So to do that, we're on a directory tab right now, this little folder, you'll go right below it. You can see I have three different kernel sessions up already and I haven't ran one bit of code. Um, so you'll just shut down the kernel. You just click shut down. So run your code, run everything through it. And then before you move on to CNNs, just come in and shut down the kernel for part two. Okay. And then if you want to keep this, um, you can go to file. You can download it as a Jupyter notebook. You can export notebook. Now let's see. So when I do DLIs, export to PDF does not work. Yeah, you'll get this every time. So what I do is I file, there's export, export as HTML, and it saves it down below, it actually downloads it. So if you bring that up, you have the whole notebook. And then if you're really interested in using like Adobe or some kind of uh, you know, PDF reader, you can print this and save it as a PDF from that, right? So. That's how I would do it if you want to save them. But it's good to have on hand. Um, but this is all, you know, this is all we're doing in the next 50 minutes. So please take your time. Um, Troy, go ahead and knock us out, put us in our groups, and uh, good luck, everybody. Awesome. Yeah, I'm going to hit um, open up breakout rooms. Um, we have seven different groups, <clears throat> so seven different rooms. Each room has a TA. The TA will introduce themselves briefly. Um, and then you guys can go ahead and jump in, make sure you're asking questions if you've got them. Um, you can always post in Slack, um, doesn't matter. So you're automatically going to be moved here in a couple seconds. 
Oh, cool. So let's wrap up in QA. No, um, I hope today was a good start to our learning. Um, we got a lot of hands-on stuff tomorrow. Um, so with that, we can go ahead. Uh, did you want to go through any of the results from the notebooks or anything? That is I'm a thinking about it. Question. Yeah, we we could. So I think <clears throat> there was a. I brought it up to you. There was an error coming up where you know the the kernel wasn't setting itself. So maybe some people, hopefully everyone nailed that. Um, yeah, I think we saw with the dense. Well, wait a second. I'll just go ahead and pull up the screen. Any of the TAs want to want to talk or anything while I'm doing this? Sorry, I didn't think to do that. I know I heard Peter and Jonathan Darcy um, going through a lot of talk. I didn't jump in on every section like I should have. Um, Caleb, like in my session, uh, there was a question that we just caught off like out of the break room just in the last minute as I was trying to answer. But there was a question about in the uh, convolution layers, there's a parameter called filters, which is either 64 or 32. Like the question was, is this something that is calculated? Basically, how are we determining what's the number that we need to use in this parameter filters for uh, the conf 2D layer? Great, thanks. Thanks for relaying that. So I saw Peter shake his head too. I think uh, I saw someone also in another room. So my claim to this all the time is there's no exact number to use. Um, we usually base a lot of the stuff off of papers we read, right? And models that have been successful. So in, in this fashion, we'd look at a paper and be like, oh, they did really well uh, with this architecture, right? <clears throat> and what you'll see with that is typically their powers of two. Um, and that's just because GPUs work faster in powers of twos. That's how our threads and blocks and uh, threads and blocks and warps and all that are, are calculated and, and formulated. So if you have something in the power of two, it, it flows a lot smoother. But there's no calculation on how many filters to use, just like we don't know the, the perfect size to use either. Um, a lot of due diligence needs to be done before you try something. Uh, read papers, right? read on your problem set. And then if you find a model, say you're just finding one open source and you're gonna try it for the first time, um, you do that and then you just, you could do a hyperparameter search if you really wanted to. So you're not sitting there just guessing and checking everything. But I don't have any validated answer that gives that other than trial and error. I think I was in your, your room, Sashank. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's basically yeah. what I said. and. You start off with models that people have used uh, for their application, and then you fine tune it for your own application. Uh, and usually 64, 128, 256 are the numbers people try. Um, yeah. But with that said, we'll see one tomorrow where there's some funky numbers. And that's just because we're mimicking our model off a of paper that was published. And that's what they found to work the best. Now, did they try every possible combination of filters and number of filters and filter size? I highly doubt it. We would still be running experiments if that was the case. But it worked for what they were doing, and, and that's what we'll mimic tomorrow. Cool. So is the question about size of filters, kernel size? Or? Well, it was more so, how do you know, the, can you calculate the best number of filters, the best number of kernel size, et cetera. Mm -hmm. At least theoretically, you can base it, base it on the local receptive field that each kernel size would have on your image, right? So that would capture these size of the features that you really want to be captured, right? And the number of layers would determine if your total receptive field would cover your entire image or not, at least theoretically, I mean, practically you need more experimentation with it, but at least theoretically, yeah, you can look up local receptive field. Yeah, that's a great point. I guess if you're looking on a super resolution image, you don't want 32 three by three filters, right? Um, you'd never cover the whole image set, let alone pick up those large features you're hoping to get from an image that size. 
Um, and the time series domain, similar things too, right? Had long continuous time series with like 2000 samples per signal. You can't have 100, well, I guess you could, yeah, 128, <clears throat> like three 1D kernels. Um, you'd never cover that span of that time series. So great, great point. Okay. Um, cool. Any any other questions? Sorry, I, I pulled up the lab. I don't know if anybody wants to benefit from walking through there or not. Um, I think we saw with the the first part, which is part two. Funny enough, um, adding dense layers didn't help anything with the uh, performance, right? It might have gave like a little bit of a bump. But we really didn't see any of those bumps until we moved to the CNN in part two. Well, CNN, the second lab. And uh, that just kind of is a, 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 testament, a testament to like how powerful CNNs are, right? And how they pick up on different features that obviously we're not going to learn from a dense network and flattening because we lose that spatial coherency, right? So if we flatten an image, you know, you lose everything with where laces are in correlation to the soles of shoes and, and, and things like that. Troy, I don't think I'm gonna go through the notebook. That's, that's it, that's literally all I would have said <laughs> if we would have went through the notebook. Sorry, yeah, that's I just, okay. I just no shut down curiosity. So I was trying to get it back up. All good. All right, do we have any other questions before we close out? Um, can I ask a question? Go for it. Um, so uh, in uh, CNN, uh, how do you calculate the, uh, all the layers? Like, do you apply the filter layer by layer? Anyone can take that. I, I would ask you to go over the question again because I didn't fully get it. But if someone picked up on what he was asking, please, please take it. Can you elaborate that a little bit? I didn't fully get it. Um, so uh, say we have uh, uh, 64 layers uh, of, of these matrices, matrices. So how do you calculate these matrices? Do you apply the uh, filter layer by layer? Or uh, do you have other ways? Uh, I'm, I'm, do you mean do you mean how does the model learn each filter per layer? I guess when you say calculate, I'm I'm kind of lost on that. Like, how do we know to pick sixty four? No, no, I'm, I'm not talking about the numbers. So but let's say we ask it to be 64 layers. Um, so do you just apply the filter uh, 64 times? We want the, the CNN to be 64 layers? Uh, yeah. The, uh, I think it's number, number of filters in this layer is 64, not, not, the, not the depth. Oh. Okay, thank you. Go ahead and take it then. If that's, I'm still trying to figure it out. Uh, actually, I didn't get the full question. So yeah, you have 64 filters. Is the question, how do I compute these filters? I mean, these are all learnable parameters. And uh, the optimization algorithm essentially uh, learns what the optimal weights and biases is for each filter. And to compute the activation in each layer, it's just a matrix, matrix multiplied. That's it. Um, and is your question, how is it done in, under the hood? Uh, or, or maybe you could elaborate a little bit more? Oh, uh, I think I understand what you're saying. So you're uh, saying that you just do that uh, multiplication like 64 times? Uh, yeah, so if you have 64 different filters, then you do that convolution operation 64 times. But that convolution operation under the hood is just a matrix, matrix multiply. I mean, that's how you implement a convolution underneath. Uh, and yes, you basically get a tensor, which is the size of the image or whatever it is, 
depending on if you have padding or not. And it's just uh, it, like the operation is on 64 times. So your output will have 64 channels. Does that okay. help? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You nailed it. Right, there was a question in the chat. So it might be a little off topic, but I was curious about the execution of these deep learning models on GPUs. Are these executed on the tensor cores or regular SMs? Not exactly sure of the differences between these, but the A100's data sheet mentions their flops performance separately. Great question. So I know tensor cores, and maybe if Robbie's still on, he might be able to talk about this better than I can. Um, but tensor cores are specifically designed to do acceleration on deep learning frameworks, right? So they help. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say tensor cores are just uh, specify specific hardware optimized for mixed precision computation, which is the type of computation that is done in deep learning algorithms. And that mixed precision is something you can flag in either framework, right? And it knows what precision to use to accelerate for training even further without losing accuracy or performance, whatever your task is. Yeah, the reason that you're able to use mixed precision in deep learning is because you're you're basically calculating approximations during each epoch. So you actually don't need like a full floating point representation, a full 32 representation, 32 bit representation of of your values, right? So you're able to reduce that precision and multiply your compute throughput in the process. Um, because like I said, you're just calculating an approximation. It doesn't, ha it doesn't have to be perfect. Thanks, Robbie. That, that's not true for scientific applications. That's why in, sci in the scientific HPC world, we don't use tensor cores. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're starting to use some mixed precision stuff for some like intermediary calculations in certain applications and stuff. But for the most part, most people are using at least single precision, if not double precision in those types of algorithms. It's really just algorithm specific and how much accuracy you need. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Robbie. I appreciate that. Cool. Any other questions? Uh, so I just had a quick follow up on that. Yeah. Thanks, Robert. Um, so um, are you saying that, you know, while these uh, DL models are being trained on the tensor cores, the SMs are essentially unused? Robbie. I actually don't know the answer to that one. Say again, sorry. So my question is uh, when these DL models are being uh, trained on the tensor cores, uh, the SMs, are they underused? I mean, uh, they, they just stay idle? The, the tensor cores are, are inside of the SMs. Okay, okay. Then maybe I, I need to read about the architecture because I mean, yeah, it was I'm advertised Googling separately. Trying, so. to, trying to find a... Uh, like a diagram for you, but basically inside of each SM, you have a number of different compute units uh, and it, it varies for each architecture that we've released. Um, and that's also, for example, why double precision compute is slower than single precision compute, right? Typically on our SMs, you have half as many double precision floating point units, uh, ALUs than you do single precision. So um, we typically measure, I mean, when we release a new GPU, we'll say the single precision and double precision and mixed precision results, but the, the main number that's usually advertised used to be historically the single precision floating point compute number. More recently, they've started to highlight deep learning performance because it's obviously really, really popular and really widely used. Um, I'm trying to find, I'll see if I can find it. I need to Google around a little bit and see if I can find it. Yeah, a, yeah, sure. A thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well. Yeah, thank you. I can wait till tomorrow. Thank you very much, Robert. Yeah, thanks again, Robbie. In an attempt not to butcher your name, but I'm going to do it. Actually, I'm not going to do it. Miss, Mr. or Mrs. Wong, <laughs> when you got oh, your hand yeah. raised. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just uh, I just discussed with Peter and gave a very good um, explanation between the fitting and our traditional fitting and some machine learning how 
uncertainties. But uh, and he, yeah, he kind of told me that uh, in order to get um, a uncertainty from uh, similar to the what we did in the traditional fitting, we need a lot more work, like training the model several times, and we need to take into account several sources of uncertainties in order to get a good estimate. So I'm wondering, for example, in the science area, we probably need a lot of cases to give an uncertainty, which have a very good estimate. So then in this case, what's the benefit uh, in such fitting problem? Um, so what's a kind of advantage in this case, if, if we use actually AI for fitting? Yeah, I'm not sure whether it's clear because yeah, uh, in the area where uncertainty is very important, uh, can we get some more advantage from AI? Are you saying AI or in general, are you asking uh, the use of GPUs for Bayesian uh, uh, analysis? Um, yeah, the, probably, yeah, the GPU based, um, okay probably Bayesian calculation. Sure. Um, it, 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 again, there's two part answer to it. Uh, I don't know if any other TA wants to take it, but I'll give a first shot. Um, so um, in full Bayesian approaches, you have this uh, MCMC kind of sampling, right? Marco chain, Monte Carlo stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of inherently sequential in nature. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if there are any algorithms that are really parallelizable. And in such cases, it may not be beneficial to use a GPU. Mm -hmm. But um, there are certain other flavors like Gaussian process regression and where you kind of assume certain analytical uh, assumptions, right? Uh, in such cases, it boils down to just like matrix vector kind of multiplications, right? There actually really helps. Okay, um, yeah, thank you. But if I, for example, I use a, a Bayesian, for example, something like Bayesian reconstruction, um, is that kind of better than the traditional fitting or some machine learning, which actually only gives you a prediction with some estimate uh, accuracy, but hard to tell the uncertainty. I wouldn't know on top of my head. Probably will have to know a little bit more about the problem. Oh, yeah, hey, yeah. Caleb, just for anyone interested, I posted, this is just some random article that I found, but it has a, a decent visualization of one SM basically in a Turing GPU. Um, that I showed, put that, yeah, I put it in the Slack channel in case anybody wanted to see. Yeah, it. so you could just see the different compute units in there. You still see your shared memory and your cache. And then in this case, this is a gaming card, so it has a ray tracing core as well, but you wouldn't have that in a data center GPU. Solid, great, great font. And then for your the previous question, Mr. Wine, yeah. um, I think if you typed it in the Slack, it'd be a mm -hmm. little easier for us to get yeah, yeah. It's a pretty long question and pretty limited. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think Praveen did a great job answering it. And I agree that it would be specific to the use case, right? Um, mm -hmm. But go ahead and put it in the, in the Slack and I think we'll get a better understanding and maybe a better answer from it. Right, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so we have 10 minutes till the end or if there's no other questions. We uh, can go ahead and wrap up now and I'll see you all tomorrow at nine. Yes, 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Pacific. Pacific. Sounds good. See you. All right, tomorrow. awesome. Yep, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, we will see you same time tomorrow. Awesome, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.